This stream is cleared for takeoff. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our monthly live developer Q&A. Happy to see everyone here in chat. Happy to be back with you today. Looking forward to answering many of your questions this morning. My name is Jane. I am the Senior Community Manager for Microsoft Flight Simulator moderating today's stream. Before we get started, I'd like to welcome back our regular panel, starting with Jorg Newman. Jorg, how are you doing today? Doing great. Good to be back. Should be a great session. Awesome. Great to have you, Jorg. In the middle, we have Sebastian Vlock. Seb, how are you? Hello, I'm great. <laughs> great to hear it. And we have Marcel Boussar. Welcome, Marcel. I'm great too. I'm very nice to be here with you tonight. Glad to have you all. Uh, chat, we have received tons of great questions already from you from a form that we sent through on our development updates that you filled out this past month. So we'll tackle um, each in three different Q&A sessions today. But of course, we're going to answer as many live questions from chat as possible. We do ask you to hold those questions when we are in our Q till we are in our Q&A session. Um, you'll see that there'll be different topics in each Q&A session, and we would ask that those questions that you have relate to each topic. Um, and you will get a chance to just ask anything, of course, at the end as well. We have two special guests that we'll introduce you to as well later on. But first, I will hand the mic off to Jorg to start our presentation. Jorg. All right. Well, <clears throat> good to see everyone. I would like to open with a heartfelt Next slide. Thank you. Um, so remember, uh, we developed the Antonov 225 and made an arrangement with Antonov that all the proceeds would go uh, to Antonov for the first year to either rebuild or make a new Antonov 225 or commemorate the existing one. And I just wanted to share the results of this. Next slide. So it, it has sold 98,141 units, which is Really good number. We have, we, or we will send $1.5 million to Antonov. And I just want to say, y'all did this. And I think it's wonderful that we can influence the real world that way and do some good. So, so thank you. Thank you very much. And then I wanted to share Dune. We talked about it last time. And I know it's not everybody's cup of tea, but I wanted to share some numbers just because. And so it's been out about three weeks. We had 2.6 million sessions so far, which is the most flown aircraft in Microsoft Flight Simulator in these last three weeks, by the way. And it is the number three most downloaded after three weeks, the number three after Top Gun Maverick and the Pelican from Halo. So I, I, I feel like um, we did good um, because people are enjoying it. And then on top of that, also great. Uh, we have record user engagement. And I it's really important for me that this is true, because basically it means y'all are playing or simming, really. And um, so I think December, January, and February, the last three months were the highest engagement numbers we've seen in the last 43 months. So that wow. tells me something really good is happening. So thank you for that as well. All right, and then the roadmap. I mean, it's early in the year, right? So we shipped um, Caribbean, uh, World Update 16 in Jan on January 30th, and alongside it, the Bell 47. Um, from any builds, and then we ship Dune two weeks later. And there's obviously lots to talk about today, including some update 15. So let's go. Absolutely. Thanks, Jorg. We will start our first Q&A session related to scenery and weather. So chat, if you do have a live question you want to ask related to scenery and weather, feel free to ask now. And we'll start by going over some of our questions that we received from the form. So this first question is, Will the shallow water texture, aka water masks, that went missing with the Caribbean World update be added back to the sim again? And if so, when? All right, did some pictures. Here we go. So the team obviously worked on this. It takes a while. I think people are like, hey, is this going to happen tomorrow? No. So basically, Sobo wrote a tool, which we call the water blur mask editor. And you can see the results. You can still see, if you look closely here, there's some of these squarey type of areas. I mean, so the water masks are all back. Some of these areas we try to edit out as much as humanly possible uh, with the tools we have and just cruise through it, Jane. I think I made eight pictures or something. Okay. Um, but basically, they're all back. And there was a question about when. Uh, we just uploaded them. 
so they're available now uh, as of, like an hour ago or something so and then an hour and a half ago so then um just to say we are I sort of talked about this like probably two or three times ago um we are doing another experiment where we are trying to get rid of the little square things and uh, it's so we had to build a special computer because it takes tons and tons of memory but um <clears throat> there might be some good news maybe next time but it's but anyways they're back Okay, our next question. Cloud turbulence and in general turbulence has been asked many times and the answers from Sobel are not clear. There is currently very little, if any, turbulence generated in the live weather clouds, no matter how thick and large those clouds are. Seb has mentioned that he will look into the cloud density and turbulence, but in the last developer stream, he was quiet about it. Are there any updates on this? Um, yes, so uh, this is a screenshot. I, I just went again uh, yesterday to test this. Uh, so unfortunately, I couldn't find any 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 thunderstorm or, or big uh, crazy uh, uh, towering cumulus formation on the on the entire planet yesterday. And, and there was a, a little bit of a big rainstorm in, in Africa. So I went there. Um, so what I would recommend is um, in the dev mode, you have the um, in the debug windows at the bottom somewhere you have something which calls debug weather. And I, I squared, I put a red square. There, there is actually a system to debug um, turbulences uh, as felt by the aircraft. Um, and it, uh, it, uh, it goes after whatever um, uh, international norms. I, I think there's a norm, you know, which uh, depending on how many Gs or how many vertical wind, uh, it goes from nil to severe. Um, and uh, and uh, so yesterday in live weather in Africa, flying through the clouds, so, uh, and also I turned on this, uh, you know, the the, uh, the visualization of the of the um, of the drafts in the weather uh, uh, screen, um, and so there was a ton of uh, of uh, of uh, air going up and 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 sort of watering and, and stuff, and uh, flying through the cloud, the strongest uh, bump I got was 0.5 g. Um, which, which on the screen didn't feel, I mean, or didn't look like a crazy much, but we are not sitting in the aircraft, right? We're just uh, watching at a, at a, at a, at a three D render of it. Uh, 0 0.5 G uh, in a very short time like this. I, I think it's 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 already pretty strong. Uh, it was classified as I can't read, but I think it says what something like light or moderate. I don't know. 0 0.5. How much that is. Uh, so it's definitely working, and and uh, and it's doing exactly the same thing than in weather presets. Um, so I could not test a thunderstorm, but I also went to see the the team who is in charge of uh, taking the um, the basically the the live weather data we have, and and uh, sort of transform it into a, a, a cloud system, and and they admitted that um, in general uh, live weather uh, data. Uh, would currently not generate uh, like the the thickest clouds, right? Uh, basically, it would always downplay it a little bit. Um, and there's some work we need to do on our side in order to fix this to make them stronger, um, and uh, and which would in the end get you more turbulences. Um, you could then always turn turn it back down with a you know there's three levels of a, of a realism on turbulences which sort of softens it out. Um, but so yeah, I can confirm they're working. They're working as designed. Um, but in the process of taking the live weather data and, and injecting it into our cloud system, um, basically it's not uh, it's not it's not uh, boosting the the, um, the density as much as it could, and uh, and uh, so we put that into the backlog, uh, see how fast we can do it. But it's it's in there, and uh, they said like two, maybe two weeks or something of work to uh, because we can't just like scale it up. It, it would just uh, break some of the clouds. Um, mm -hmm. So here. That's, uh, that's what we found. Okay. Thank you so much Seb, for investigating that issue. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, read a few live questions that I saw related to scenery. Um, it seems like you improved bridges and extrusions with the New World updates. However, harbor areas still kind of look like a mess. Do you have any plans for harbor and harbor cranes that you can share with us? So it's a city by city thing. Um, <clears throat> so basically, we have a pretty large team going through. We call it the tin editing team, for what it's worth, and they go through cities um, to make sure that the bridges can be flown under. Certain landmarks are looking great because we had these issues. Remember in Canada, some of you might remember. Um, so we are trying to never have that happen again. 
And then we are going back to older world updates and city updates and cleaning those out as well. So it's just a, it's just really just a matter of time. It's more grunt work than anything, mm -hmm. um, but it's happening. Yeah. Thanks, Georg. Here's a question. I believe we are going to address this in our Sim Update 15 section, but I'll ask it right now. There are square patches of scenery that appear and disappear on scenery, either dirt squares or same textures, but blurry. Are there any options to, f to fix this? Yeah, so I get there's three individuals that sent me emails frequently, um, and that's useful. So I forward that to the team. Um, so we just talked about this yesterday. Uh, this should be fixed for some update 15. It, I think it's a server side fix. So it's not like you're getting, you know, it's in the next version or something. But um, but the dev in charge of this seems to know exactly what's happening and told me it's going to happen. <laughs> so I think so. Nice. All right. Our next question. Frozen water bodies are still present in Sim Update 15 beta, for example, on Svalbard Island. Ever thought of making some kind of ice exclusion mask to disable frozen water despite high snow levels? Why is snow height used as the proxy to identify if water bodies are frozen? Would an air temperature with thresholds defined for sweet and salt water be easier and more relevant? Um, I'm taking this one. Sure. So uh, also yesterday I checked. Uh, so um, in Svalbard, actually, the, 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 so this is the map of uh, ice, uh, ice sea water. I, I mean, how do you call it? Ice shelves. This is the real time map of ice shelves um, right now. So in Svalbard, there is ice shelves right now. Um, I mean, this is. I mean, at least this is the map coming from Meteor Blue. So that's that's the 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 trusted data source we're using. Um, on the very next screen, uh, it's the same area, but uh, this is the snow depth map. And you can see that it pretty much matches. So um, why are we using snow depths? It's, it's a very simple answer is that if some satellite, because I mean, this is measured by satellite, right? The satellite scans and if it's if it sees snow, um, then it adds some snow depths. Um, if there is snow on the water, there has to be ice, right? Snow doesn't um, just, it doesn't snow into the water and it stays there if there's no ice shelf. So it's a pretty reliable data source to know if there's an ice shelf in the area. And you can see the match is uh, not perfect, but almost. Um, so on the, ne the next um, uh, page is the, the suggestion is the temperature data in this area. And the issue is that you can see that um, uh, we can get up to 10 degrees Celsius in some areas where there is actually ice shelves and and putting a threshold um, for salted water, how, how much would we pick like minus, if you look here, um, um, where the ice shelves actually are uh, around Swalbard, it's minus uh, 10 or something, minus 15. Um, if we set a threshold at minus 15 to match the real data, anytime you get minus 15, I mean, you can get minus 15 in Bordeaux, uh, we would have ice shelves in the water. So, so um, um, the, 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 the ice shelves don't form by, it's not just air temperature, it's, it's, it's cold air temperature and cold water temperature over a very long time. So it has to be like more the average temperature. And, uh, and, and I'm, so I'm not a specialist, but I'm pretty sure currents uh, play a, a big role too. So, so air temperature is a really bad uh, data source. Average air temperature over uh, six months, or which is really just climate. Climate, yes, maybe, but then we lose all form of real-time accuracy, like a year that is hotter or something, we would not have a, a good representation. Um, and and uh, and so why don't we use the, if you go back two pages, mm -hmm. the real ice shelf data, because it exists. So the problem with the ice shelf data, as you can see, it only, the data source we currently have only displays uh, ice shelves on, on, on oceans. And, and unfortunately, the resolution is pretty bad. When we zoom in, um, Sometimes the data goes to the to the shore, but sometimes it stops ten or twenty miles away from the shore, and uh, and um, so if we said, hey, let's use the ice shelf data on oceans and then the snow data on land, um, we would have uh, around all uh, water bodies, uh, pretty much uh, all shores would be without ice, which is not realistic. So, the best solution we have right now is um, is this. So next page, snow snow depths which is very close to the actual ice shelves. We, we tuned, thanks to the community feedback this winter, we tuned the, the data um, and, and the depths at which we, we trigger uh, to a new value, which uh, seems to work a lot better. 
Um, so um, if you see areas where it's it's like crazy bad, um, what I encourage you is if you if you see if you see an area, just go into a reliable data source like here and look look it up. So I mean, if you live there, just look outside, but look it up. And and even if you live there, still look up the data the 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 meteor blue ice ice uh, coverage data. So um, because you will see basically pretty much what we're doing. And and maybe the data source is wrong sometimes. I don't know where they get the, the ice shelf coverage from. I think it's satellite. I know that when we had discussions with them, the issue is that sometimes um, this, you know, when it's cloudy, the satellite can't take a picture for months and they just sort of have formulas to 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 find where there should be ice. And so it, it's not always perfect. Right. And there is no there is right now no other data source than satellites for this. So, so I think we're doing our best. Um, maybe there's always room for improvement, but right now in in Svalbard, it's it's uh, it's doing fine, and uh, and uh, it's the it's the best data source we have right now. Great, thank you, Seb. All right, our next question: Small and medium rivers are all around the world often look very bad because of an inaccurate three D water track over the satellite imagery. Is it planned for future work on rivers and water mass to let us see some nice colored waters and stream beds? Yeah, I can take that. So, <clears throat> so maybe just to make sure that we all understand how this really works, right? So there's there's something called DEM, right? This digital elevation map that is other people call it height field sometimes. That basically gives us the amount of vertices we have to play with, um, and then when the river goes through it, if the resolution of the DEM is great, then you will see basically cliffs and you know whatever the river carved into the terrain pretty damn accurately if like for example in the united states i think it looks mostly really good we can help that a little and we've talked about doing that by essentially tracing the shores of the river and maybe even the center point of the river so the way we so i talked to the bing guys about this the way we would do this if we do it we haven't started but if we do it we will do this inside osm most likely because that's where a lot of the data already lives and it's an, it's an open source uh, open data thing which is nice and so we could go trace this, but if if the resolution of the dam isn't good enough, it doesn't really help us much. Um, so, as I said, like we are collecting them everywhere on the planet. We do this for world updates and just in general as a matter of course. There's a team dedicated to that too. Um, but in some areas of the world, we have what is called the Copernicus fallback. So Copernicus has three data sources. Um, it's an EA EAA ten EE. A10, which is basically 10 meter uh, for Europe, some of Europe. And then there's GLOW 30 and GLOW 90, which is either 30 or 90 meter resolution. 90 meter is really bad. We don't use it. So we use the 30 meter resolution. If we don't have better data everywhere, 30 meters, when you when you, when you you fly down a river, you will see sometimes the river sort of goes banks up a hill. That is because the resolution of the dam isn't high enough. And the only way to really fix that is for us to get better dam. And we are working literally with every government, geographical organization on this earth to get the best that we can possibly get. Some countries have great stuff. Some countries have almost nothing. So we are a little bit dependent on, on others. Great. Thank you, Jörg. One live question from chat. Is it possible that texture revolution is it possible that texture resolution and draw distance can be separated into their own sliders and not both be controlled by terrain level of detail, or do those two have to go together? Are we talking about uh, um, I think, I think, <laughs> I'm pretty sure there's two different sliders. I mean, one is a slider, terrain detail, and the other is called texture, what's the name, French name? Texture level, texture detail, something like that. A little bit further down. And and that's just that. So uh, I don't know what. Uh... Okay, we'll see if we get. Yeah. Can I grab one? Sure thing. Huh? There was what there was a pre there was one some directly related to what I said. Um, so somebody said, is that also true for flat things? Yeah, the answer is no. <laughs> so say it's, you know, sort of the southern part of Texas or something, which is very flat. That is where the tracing of the river outline would help us. Um, so we, that is that is also why we're discussing doing it. So I, I, it's definitely a long-term goal of mine to get the both the shoreline and the rivers better. Okay. 
And clarification from chat, they're speaking on ground textures for texture evolution. Nice. Yeah, so the, the on the ground textures, um, there's a, I mean, we can go down, which is what the, the I think the option in the graphics menu, when you go down texture something, detail or something, mm -hmm. it, it goes down, right? Um, if you want to go up, the thing is that when you set this to the highest level, we are pretty much displaying the highest texture resolution that we get from the from from the data source, uh, uh, and and sometimes so I think that's a two sixty six fifty six by two sixty six per tile. Um, sometimes it can be a little bit blurry, and then when when there's new data updated, it gets better. But it's not never going to be more than the maximum resolution of the tile, mm -hmm. and that's why the only way to get even more is then to push out the terrain level of detail, which is really just set uh, lo loading a higher LOD, which means higher texture resolution further away. So, so that's really what that's doing. So, yeah. So, uh, for what yeah. oh, I'm sorry. I just want to say something with the data. So, the data comes through Bing. <clears throat> we have multiple different data providers for different areas of the world. Max of Excel, Airbus, and then some specific ones in places like India. And they come with different resolutions, but Scepter set. So, most of our satellite data nowadays is 30 centimeter, but some of it is 50. And then when we get an update, sometimes we get we go from from 50 to 30, which is better. Um, and then the texture, quote unquote, texture would get better. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thank you. All right, next question. What is the latest on the weather API and ability to function in a 3D model? <laughs> okay, yeah. Well, it has been a, a long discussion, right? Um, so it's more, it's not really a technical reason why we don't have any weather API. It's more a matter of uh, owning the data that we could expose. Uh, we are not owning any data here. We are using the, the data which is provided by our partner, Meteo Blue, and they are doing a great job to do that. And this is cost money. And uh, the word for us would be to distribute their data so people could use Flight Team as a, a bumper to to get and use this data. So it's very hard for us to expose something that we don't own at the end. So mm -hmm. with our API, it, it would be difficult for us to, to have one. OK, thank you. Next question. Seasons were planned from MSFS 2020 since the first trailers. Why were they moved to 2024? Am I um, taking this? <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, I mean, the the the. So seasons, were, I think, were displayed in a, in a, in one of the maybe the launch trailer. Um, so what we really showed is snow winter, and uh, even though winter was not present uh, when the sim shipped in August, uh, we introduced it I think in December of the same year when basically winter started, um, and it's been there since uh, ever. I mean, even ice shelves and stuff. What we said, uh, I mean, when we say seasons, it's not just winter and summer, which is snow, no snow. Um, it's uh, it's going way beyond that. So there is add-ons which change the tree color slightly, but it's 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 uh, I would say not what we consider being seasons, right? For us, seasons and we always said that it's much more. It's a uh, it's a uh, trees losing losing leaves. It's maybe different field colors. It's maybe um, I mean a lot of stuff, right? It could be different. I mean, when I fly around here, there's there's like a ducks migrating. There's all sorts of stuff happening in seasons. Currently in 2020, what you have is the snow in the winter. You have the live weather affecting temperatures, rain, clouds. Um, from I mean, in many regions, that's that's a fairly high fidelity uh, in terms of seasons. From high up there, you don't necessarily see um, exactly that. I mean, a, a big difference from what we have now. In some areas, like uh, maybe I don't know Canada, where where it gets all red in this in the in the autumn, uh, it's not that uh, that high fidelity right now. Um, but the 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 plan we had for seasons is a very big plan, which is pretty much throwing a lot of stuff out of the window and rewriting it. And that's why we moved it to 2024, um, because it's a big, big rewrite with a lot of um, a lot of new and and different features. Um, but in 2020, you have snow, you have a you have the winter weather, you have a lot of stuff already. Yep. Great. Thank you, Seb. All right, what happened to the world update fixes slated for Sim Update 15 that are not included currently in the beta? Yeah, because there are Sim update, uh, world updates, so they're separate packages. So I think a few hundred fixes have been made, and they are, that's true, it's not in the beta, but we are going to release all those packages 
by the time sim update 15 comes out mm-hmm. but when you think about it it's not in the in the sliding build you know so it's basically marketplace stuff yeah great thanks Jorg. um so, and i would go back there was a bunch yeah. of questions before yeah. we close on scenery Going back, um, touching on the terrain level of detail, there's a comment that said the problem is that terrain level of detail controls the resolution of airport ground textures and aerial texture re- resolution. It'd be great if we had uh, apron ground textures and texture resolution, but would not be bound to terrain level of detail. Yeah, we, we only have one terrain mm. system. We don't have a one terrain system for aerial Bing data and then one terrain system for uh, airports or whatever, aprons or, or anything else. It's the same system and it's all baked mm-hmm. into a picture which has the same resolution than the aerial, so to align it perfectly. And so there, I mean, it, it would be, it's already a very, very expensive system, right? The terrain, there's a lot of, of stuff to handle and to manage. And if we had two systems, one just to, to get better lines or anything that would be that would be difficult to uh, to do so that's why we it's basically just the same system there's one terrain and it bakes everything on it and and uh, and uh, if you want higher resolution you need to push it out further to get uh, to get something mm-hmm. i would say just because i saw three or so comments i'm not clear if you guys are talking about bespoke airports or the what we call procedural or generic airports like which ones are you talking about question if you, could, if you could just comment like just okay. i mean because clearly people care about this but there were other questions jane that i think were worth looking into sure yep um there was a question uh, about fpfs drops in storms because of translucent clouds um are there any updates on on removing translucent clouds or changing them in any way for the future uh, nope. <laughs> yeah, I see that. Um, I see that myself on uh, mm-hmm. on my computer, which is almost never GPU bound. It's always the CPU, which is the limiting factor. Except sometimes when I fly through a cloud, where I see the GPU being a little bit more loaded. Uh, I think that's a uh, and clouds is very much pixel um, intensive. Mm-hmm. So there is really, unfortunately, only two ways to do that: is either reduce the cloud level of detail or or the screen, uh, like a super sample in TAA, like the the, the how much we scale the, the screen. Um, maybe, I mean, one day we could think of a system where if you're in a cloud, we maybe automatically reduce the level of detail because you, you can't see any other cloud anyway. But the problem I think is that um, when you change the level of detail, because we add more and more, uh, you know, little, you know, little bumps, um, if you change the level of detail, you could pretty much be out of a cloud uh, or in a cloud. You know, it may not be the same. So, I don't even know how much uh, how much that's possible. And and uh, mm-hmm. if the tech artist in charge hears me saying that there's a possible fix, uh, he would maybe shoot me. So I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll take we'll take it back. So, except on the airports, it was about handcrafted airports, both ours and third parties. Yeah, but I think it's the same. They're all still baked into. Uh, I would say everything is 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 baked. When, when we say baked, you know, there's like if there's 50 textures one over the other, we all we render everything in in a final texture, mm. which has the the size of the aerial detail or which which we get from. I mean, there's a, a standard, right? Because the the t- detail we get is 256 by 256. Everything has that same size. We render everything in there, and if you want to get something better, we have to pretty much. Uh, um push the detail out further away um there is a, a an issue with the maximum detail that's something which is a, a, a current limitation of the of the 2020 engine um but uh, that's really only happening when you're very close to the camera um and on ground um but further away yeah we don't have a way to to sort of um change that or maybe um i mean at least in 2020 maybe we could double you know we could have a, a 512 texture and then render everything into that to get more pixels um but that's a big big change of a of a rendering engine and so in 2020 that's something we can we can write not right or not uh, not not uh, not plan somebody was commenting is this you know the textures look better in the 2024 trailer yes mm-hmm. <laughs> the new stuff 
Yes, it's a totally different system. We'll, we'll talk about it maybe in Houston, uh, in, in, in Vegas or something. I don't know. So, <laughs> but uh, awesome. anyway, so I think, we'll, we'll, as you know, we always look at the chat log after this. So we'll, we'll go through all these again, make sure that we read everything. Yep, absolutely. All right, let's talk about Sim Update 15, which comes out. Probably. <laughs> So, you know, so we moved it back. If you if you actually go back to the last last presentation we have, it was planned for 312, and I wisely didn't put that in the development roadmap because it was like, you know, I mean, this is a big update. It has a ton of stuff and a lot of fixes, and we're not going to put something out that's not good. So um, that that mm -hmm. this might this might move by a few days. It's possible. Okay. But that's our current target. And then here, just to show, we talked about this last time, so we don't need to do this again. Tons of fixes. Uh, we added a few here on the back next page, right here. So there's additional controller support that we added here. So um, we'll publish this tomorrow, I think. Uh, and then the gra ground texture popping, which also came up in the chat a few times, mm -hmm. we going to be fixed. Uh, oh, go back. Oh, yeah. There's one more thing. Oh, yeah, the P51s. Yes. A lot of people said, hey, the P51s run out of fuel. You can't finish arena race, et cetera, et cetera. So there was just a bug. It's fixed. So yay. And then here, I made it green just to show you how much we tackled. So this is the lifetime bugs that we tackled for 15. And if you go to the next one, new things that were mentioned. So the stuff in green are the things we've done. Awesome. There's a update. lot. Yeah, and that'll come out tomorrow in, in the development update. Mm -hmm. Some additional topics here to discuss. Stability, Waza memory, and the LOD changes of Xbox. Who'd like to discuss? Um, I can start with uh, stability. Sure. Um, so, uh, same update 15 has a lot of stability changes. So we. Um, we fixed a, a large, uh, a ton of a ton of crashes and and bugs, uh, and we did a ton of improvements on the memory management, which is a more an issue, I would say, on the on the console. Um, at the same time, we also added a lot of stuff, and uh, and uh, you can see the list. One particular being uh, live traffic, which has more complexity, more variety, more just a lot more, and and that's something which is extremely heavy on the on the console memory. Uh, so I think that's one of the reasons also why we, we need a few more uh, weeks is we're doing more adjustments on stability uh, to try to get the, the, the system not to crash and to adapt um, to adapt to whatever the user is, where he's flying, what aircraft he's flying, what add-on he's, he's, he's installed. And uh, uh, right now, finally, after all the changes, the numbers are looking, are looking good. I would say even better than on the previous uh, simulated 14, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, so that's good, um, and uh, and yeah, but that's I think that's been a struggle here because of the, all the all the additions. So we had to do a lot of more opt optimizations. One of the optimizations I'm is gonna link into the the three, third line, but uh, I will let Martial talk about uh, the second item. Uh, the wasm module, okay. Uh, so the WASM module is the part on the SDK that uh, reads uh, a plus, uh, C++ code and translates that into JavaScript, uh, because JavaScript is the, the tech we are using internally uh, since uh, flight in 2020. And uh, this WASM module was not written here at the it's something pretty standard. And we have uh, looked at it, and it looks like the WASM, it looks like we figured out that uh, this WASM module was doing somehow some bug allocations. So it does the allocation of memory by blocks and it's very linear. And when you uh, create some new blocks, uh, the, the way it was working was not, you know, the, the, this module was not able to uh, to unallow some, some blocks. So for instance, on initializations, uh, third party was doing plenty of things. And during the in initialization, we had a lot of allocations of new memory and this memory was never been freed after that and it was blocked forever oh, well forever uh, at least until the the module was not used anymore so uh what we did and thanks to eric pelissier and the sdk team hi guys uh they um rewrite a part of the uh, was module uh 
<laughs> it's pinging me like thanks. Um, so what they did it was to uh, to write a, a virtual memory allocation, and uh, in, uh, thanks to that we can now free some some part and and the modules are taking very um, uh, very much less uh, amount of memory. Everything's get freed, and uh, this peak of allocations during the initialization does not cost uh, uh, memory allocations anymore. There's two conditions to that for, for having the, the, the use of these improvements. Uh, the very first one is to you have to recompile the, the C++ code to JavaScript using the new module that has been done for the Simodate SDK, Simodate 5, uh, 15 SDK. And the other one is to use Simodate 15. I said Simodate 5, Simodate 15. Mm -hmm. And well, uh, with that um, optimization in Simulated 15, uh, it will, well, we will have a, a way much better um, memory management and uh, this will help us uh, and our partners to, to put more stuff. And I think we will talk about that later, right? Having better planes and with, with uh, more uh, functionalities working on flight team. Somebody asked about the magnitude of the savings, because mm -hmm. I think just say it. Uh, last time, well, Eric, please help me. No, last time we talked, uh, last time we talked about it, well, it was huge, like for uh, for from uh, fifty megabytes to to a few. Yeah, I think it's forty to sixty is the number I saw megabytes. So it's not like gigabytes worth of memory or something. But as you know, so you know, with the whole black screen thing. That, that only happens when you're running out of memory and we are, we are pushing memory here pretty tight to the edge and 50 megabytes is a lot. Mm -hmm. So just, oh, it's not like some magic gigabyte, gigabytes are coming back, but it's great that Eric and the team got this done. Yeah, well done. Um, any comments on the LOD changes of Xbox? Yeah, so um, so when we started flighting the um, uh, update 15, um, we had done a few optimizations uh, for memory, so there was a lot of stability fixes, and there was all the new features. And the very thing, first thing we had is that uh, memory was a lot worse on the Xbox because of the all the additional things. Um, and uh, what we tried, we tried a few things in in various different lightings. Uh, one we tried was to dynamically um, reduce the number of uh, traffic, air, air traffic, pretty much when when the memory is running out. Uh, the problem is that uh, we can't really just we, we can't do it by number. We have to do it by like sort of distance, right? Take out a distance, and and the problem is that in general, when you run out of memory, it's in a in an airport, um, and uh, there was really only two options: either we reduce the distance below whatever your current terminal or something, and then we really get a reduction in aircraft, but then the airport feels empty, or we move the distance. Uh, out at least, I don't know, five, six kilometers the size of the airport. And then the number of aircraft is too high anyway. And so we were sort of stuck. And so we removed that. It, it didn't work. Uh, so uh, the live traffic is always at the at the, at the maximum, uh, I would say, the, um, level of detail. There's no, there's no reduction on that. Um, what we found is anyway, the, the biggest uh, cost in memory is on console is pretty much always textures. Um, and uh, so we did a few tests, and uh, and so we have now reached a, a good compromise. Um, uh, so the, I think one of the tests we did was a little bit too aggressive, uh, which made a cockpit text uh, unreadable. Uh, so the system really works in a way that um, if the memory is clean and you don't have a, it's not full, it doesn't it doesn't change anything, right? But if you are maybe playing for a very long time or have a very big aircraft add-on or a very big airport or many, many add-ons or whatever. At some point, if the memory runs close to uh, 15, between 20% of free, which, you know, we, we need a we need a free buffer of memory to be able to load and unload stuff and, and do stuff. So we need a 15 to 20% free. When it goes over this, pretty much what happens is that the texture resolution is reduced. And so the final compromise we ended up with is that um, the Xbox X has a higher resolution by default for textures, I think, and you if you go into the the, the graphic menu, uh, you know there's texture texture. We talked we talked about texture reason a, a, a few minutes ago. Um, I think uh, Xbox X is like higher ultra or something, 
and the S would be medium or low, right? So the, they already have different uh, resolutions. And what happens now is if uh, memory almost runs out, this goes gets it gets turned tuned down by one by one level. Um, what we tested in uh, previous flighting was uh, like everything was set to low, um, and even below low actually, and, uh, and it made the textures unreadable whether you were on S or on uh, X. And what we did now is we turn it down, but uh, low I think is still readable, and so um, we still gain enough memory. Um, um, we we just run the tests today. Uh, I think we didn't see any black screen on black avionic screen on on X and a very small number. I would say less than ever on uh, Xbox S, and so that's a very good uh, sign. And so I think that's the final setting sort of that we're we're going to keep uh for this update exactly. and so there's yeah. so there's been a lot of questions on pc mm -hmm. uh, and and this this all these changes are really exclusive to 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 the console the 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 changes that have happened on pc is that we changed the memory management um completely the the low level management how it works uh, we're going through a virtual alloc instead of a heap alloc because we found out that heap alloc after 10 hours of gameplay would just come run extremely slow and uh, and virtual alloc doesn't and so mm -hmm. this up the memory all memory everything memory pretty much by almost a factor of 100 uh, after a long gameplay um and uh, but this doesn't change any LOD things and so there has been reports of people saying hey i have a different LOD level on simulated 15 nah, nah. so our qa spent the last two days to do photos screenshots uh world update to sim update and we did not see any any difference so um, i mean any downgrade or anything so it's a it's a it's something which so the code was not changed so there's no reason and now what could what can always happen is sometimes people for whatever reason have a connection issue and uh, and they don't get uh the highest resolution data that that that's been reported before um or cache a rolling cache i don't know stuff like that but in a normal condition as i mean we only tested for two days, right? But we tested all the cases and and before after, and we didn't see any change. There was no code change, so on PC it should not it should not affect anything. And on console, there is not really LOD change. It's more um, a texture resolution, and it's not even the it's not even the textures that you really see. It's the it's the normal map. It's the um, ambient occlusion map. It's the specular map. It's it's the secondary material maps that uh, uh improve the i would say the the look and feel of the material but they don't change re change readability or stuff like that mm -hmm. um we have i think there were a lot of questions saying like so i i do yeah. think we should go if if you could like because i i don't want people to walk away saying we, we're just not listening like we're listening plenty like as a matter of fact if you would see the amount of effort that goes on to compare things like hey because some people said hey it looked better at launch so we make screenshots, yeah. compare them. It's like, nope, not, we'll not really. So we'll go through <laughs> the questions here. Um, we'll start here, Edson, with Parallel 42 here. Yeah. Our product testers are reporting decreased uh, quality of textures on Series S, not on X, with um, the campout mod as an example. A single tent in the middle of the desert looks like it lowers a JPEG. Is the internal goal for Series S users to not see a noticeable difference, or is this the breaking point where it's time to draw a line and they'll start seeing a visual difference? What? What? So someone is reporting a difference in on what? On what? It's, they're a, it's a camp out ad where you basically it's for bush. It's for bush. Yeah. Right. So I think I think this is so. So on what did they report that? On sim update 15 flighting, the one yes. which is out right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so that is the test which I said we 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 sent out one flighting. We were extremely aggressive. Yeah, you don't. Uh, you don't and, have and everything it. was <laughs> yeah, everything was good. So the goal was really to measure. Oh, does it do any good? Right. So what you do is you you if you have an optimization which is like a degradation, you set it full. Like I mean, you you set it to 200 percent. You send it out and you see does it do anything? Right. Because if it doesn't do anything, then we can just say oh it's it's not worth doing anything. And we saw a significant reduction in in crashes and in in back of units. So we say so okay, it helps. And then we fine tuned it. And no, you should not see a significant reduction in texture quality on on Xbox S um, uh, in the next flight. I think in 19. I don't know what the number is, but the one which is the one which we are building right now. So I don't know when it's going to be released, but I would say the next one. It should be back to what you're used to see uh, in theory. I mean. 
Yeah, we, we so we, we I look at all these chat messages like we know like so we had a, we had actually had a pretty good conversation like what is what is what is flighting for, and flighting is for testing stuff, right? That we put it out there and then we get feedback and then we adjust it. <laughs> so this is exactly what flighting is for. Flighting is not for having a perfect build that's pre-release, right? That's not what we're doing. So and do we communicate what we're doing? Yep, there's release notes on everything. <laughs> So there's never anything we're doing that you don't see. So I don't know. So it's there's that. And then said there's some other stuff. Like I just saw something. Hey, it might be a good idea to have a different version on Xbox than PC. Just just go talk about this a little bit more. <laughs> what people are saying. What do they mean a different? I mean, it's a different version. It's not the same executable anyway, but uh, yeah. Do they mean not the same time frame or I mean? I don't know what that exactly means. Yep. If you can communicate a little bit more what you actually mean, that would be great. Another question uh, earlier was, why not allow Xbox users the ability to choose between a performance mode and a quality mode for graphics or resolution, as is the case with some other games? Ah, that's a very good, uh, it's a very good idea. Um, so the issue is that, um, um, in, so in general, when you do that, uh, um, uh, let me step back uh, on, on consoles in general a lot more than on PC uh, users tend to have TVs which are vsynced and uh, and uh, and so there's really only 30 or 60 FPS right you, you're not gonna go to uh, 27.1 or whatever you need to you need to be at 30 if you want to have a performance mode it's to get 60 FPS right mm -hmm. or maybe on some TVs you can have 45 I think I mean there's exceptions right some yeah. some people yeah. have monitors but in in general by and large it's 30 or 60 and the performance mode is 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 there to get you up to um, to 60. I think it's something which we have later down the road in the questions um, is uh, how does it work on the console because on PC um, um, if you have a machine which is about the performance of the Xbox, uh, um, you may get sometimes 30, sometimes 40, sometimes 20 FPS. How does it work that the console is always at 30? Well, we have a we have a variable quality uh, meter. It, it basically records the performance and it dynamically adjusts um, all sorts of settings to hit actually 35. We try to hit on Xbox, we had tried to hit 35 uh, stable. Um, that way we have a little bit of room. If we go below, we reduce, uh, we adjust basically. And that way with the V-Sync on, we're always at 30. Um, so that's already, that's already sort of a dynamic performance mode. It always adjusts stuff dynamically for you to be at 30. If we, if we sort of hard code this, then all you would get is sometimes you're at 30 and sometimes you're not at 30 at 15. Um, and, um, in order to say, okay, so can we do a system where we have so where we degraded so much that we can go up to 60. And there is an issue here is that um, on the console, we cannot really, even if we go super low on all the details, we're not 100% sure that we're going to match 60 all the time. We may get 60 a lot of times, but then sometimes in some super heavy airports, you're going to drop to 30. And, and uh, what I know from performance mode, and we have developed some, is that you need to really be at 60 stable and not drop any FPS because dropping from 60 to 30 feels really awful. And, and that's the difficulty. That's why we didn't do one uh, at this time. It's just it, it requires a lot more optimization to be really stable above 60 uh, in order to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. said. All right. Our, we have a subject that we'd like to talk about now that I'm seeing lots of questions about. about and that is the Anybuilds A320 Airbus. And with that, we'd like to introduce our first guest, uh, Cameron from Hindi Builds. Welcome, Cameron. How are you? Hello. Good, thanks. Great to be here today. Yeah, really glad to have you on. Um, here to talk about, of course, the Airbus A320. Uh, what's been going on with that? What are the updates? Are we going to see it soon? I'll give the time over to you. Yeah, so I think I'm going to start going over about like what what is the a320neo why is it why is it cool you know like what why, why do you want to fly it well mm -hmm. i think one of the main things we move over to here is the the engine right the engine is what makes the neo the neo if it's not there it's currently called the ceo so current engine option neo is new engine option and that's mm -hmm. what we have here and it is a well 
masterpiece maybe is a bit too far, but it's somewhere close to that. This engine uses around 15 to 20 percent less fuel than the old engine. Now, that, that sounds pretty good, right? You think, well, it's a good saving, but that actually gives you 15 to 20 percent more range. So that's really good. You know, that, that, that is why so many airlines want these engines fitted to their aircraft. But you can also see here it is really rather large <laughs> for the size of this aircraft compared to the old and the blade sort of design. So if I come in quite close to the engine now here, you can see it's very, very modern. It's almost totally different design to the older style engines. It's actually, if you already know it, the 777 used to use a uh, an engine called the G90, still fitted now. This is actually a miniaturized version of that with a lot of different technology going on. And that's where this kind of uh, extra gains come from. It's got 50% less noise, roughly, and around about 50% less NOx emissions, which is, these are numbers that are multiple generations worth of sort of leaping ahead. And, and that's why this aircraft is the most popular aircraft in the world. It's got around about 12,000 A320s of flying, and there's around 3,200 NEOs in service today. Uh, so I think I'll come on and show you some of the extra details that we have here as well. So you can see if we come right up close to the aircraft, a lot of this text as well is very legible because we've taken this from uh, decals. So you can actually go right up close to it and you can actually see a huge amount of detail on the walk around. Your head height is roughly around about here if you want to kind of copy that when you do a walk around and you're looking for these kind of main areas here and the avionics inlet outlet on that side. Uh, but I'm just going to jump back into the cockpit now shortly. I've already got the aircraft set up, so we're ready to go. And we'll do a quick engine start. So going around the flight deck as well, you can see that there's really good level of detail. If we bring it really quite close, you can kind of see there's almost no loss of quality when we get right up close to it. And from a functionality standpoint, pretty much everything on this overhead is clickable. So, you know, I can click here, turn the ADRs off. Everything should operate as you would expect. So I'm just going to put the APU bleed on and I'm just gonna put one of the packs on and you'll actually hear a slight change in the audio in the flight deck. So let's start the engine. First of all, you move it to ignition start and you can actually see this is something that's slightly different on the Neo. These Fadex here, they power up. So you saw we had the Amber X's before and now they've powered up. So we can actually see the information before we started. We're good to go. So let's start engine number one. Now, this is quite a different start process uh, to make sure I actually done. Yeah, there we go. This is actually quite a different start process to the conventional aircraft. So you can see it starts spinning up. Everything is hotter. Everything is faster on the Neo because it's that next generation of technology. So generally, you would see on older engines when you get to about 20 percent N2, something like that, the fuel will start to go in. So you can see now no fuels going in and it's going to keep going till about 30 percent, something like that and then we'll see the fuel being introduced. So it should do it around about now. And there you go, you can hear the light off in the background and our temperature is rising. Now, here's an interesting thing that we've been able to model. This aircraft here today, we're at Le Bourget Airport, roughly around where the Paris Air Show is set. And if you've done uh, an engine start within six hours, the engine will actually crank to cool itself down because the engine gets so hot in normal operations it has to cool itself down before it starts. And it will do that for a full around 55 seconds. So if you get this aircraft um, and you think, what's the engine doing? Is it broken? No, you've just done a turnaround. The engine's already warm and it's going to be cooling itself down. It's not necessarily based on temperature. It's based on time. So that's engine number one started. So let's do number two. Well, while the engine is starting there, we can talk a little bit more about some of the details that we've been able to capture inside here. So this is always an interesting one with Airbus aircraft. So opening the window, you think, okay, we just open the window, which is fair enough. But now we go to close the window and it actually won't close. Now, this is a real feature of the aircraft. You have to unlatch the window lock, come back and then close the window. Reason for that is if you were evacuating the aircraft as, a, as the pilot from the flight deck, the window would slide back and hit you. So you need to unlatch it and then allow it to close back forward again which um, we've modeled the correct way to open and close the window. It catches people out in the real aircraft. I've seen it trying to move it. You think, why won't it open? Why won't it close? <laughs> but that, that's the reason why. Uh, so yeah, we're nearly done on the engine start here, but you can already see what I'm talking about with uh, temperatures wise. Everything's just a little bit, um, little bit more with the, with the Neo. Now, 
let me just make sure we get all this set up properly. So we're going to arm the ground spoilers, do this, and we're going to turn off the rest of the items. Now, one thing that we've integrated as well um, is we've used the new Sim Update 15 ground handling in the A320, and I think it gives a, a really nice feeling uh, for when you're taxing the aircraft. So I'm going to just show you now. So if I release the parking brake and I just add a little bit more power onto the aircraft, we start to roll. Now I'm going to move my rudder full to the left and I'm going to move it full to the right. And then it, it kind of has a bit of momentum to it where it wants to try and skid the nose wheel, which is absolutely realistic. Uh, and I think it gives a really great feeling for the aircraft now. So I'm just going to do a very quick takeoff. We're all programmed here. And I'm going to talk as we taxi out a little bit more about the uh, fly-by-wire going on here. So the Neo is unique because the fly-by-wire actually starts to kick in at around about 80 knots on the takeoff roll. So when you pull back on the stick, you're actually already um, in the fly-by-wire range. And what it does is it will pitch the aircraft up so you can't really strike the tail, which is very nice to have. And also it doesn't, it means that no matter what sort of setting you've got and sort of uh, center of gravity and things like that, it compensates for it to give a much more consistent feel. So I'm just gonna do a takeoff now. So we've got our 50%, I'm gonna put the thrust down and you can see the engines are stabilizing and I'm going to do a full power takeoff. So Mantoga SRS and it's there it goes. Now the engines, they may sound like, um, ah, <laughs> that's my mistake. Serves me right for not using the takeoff memo, but it'll be mm -hmm. fine. <laughs> uh, so let's just cancel that. So we've got the flaps out now, that's fine. So when we, uh, when we reach the 100 knots now, we've neutralized the stick and we reach V1. And I'm just pulling back slightly on the stick you can see I'm not moving it, but it's actually pitching itself up slowly over the time. Gradually get into the air. Now, I'm going to release the stick and the fly bar is fully active and we are in the air with the gear up. Nice. So let me just bring that up there. Okay. Now, one thing I'm just going to quickly show you, and I think that's probably about all we've got time for, is I'll do uh, a fly by wire demonstration. So if you imagine right now, we've got full power audio available. And what I'm going to do is put one of the flaps down another setting. And I'm just going to pull the stick all the way back. And you can see that it starts to hit this limit here. It will not go any higher. And I'm going to hold the stick back just to prove it. You can kind of see the flight controls are fully back. It's going to keep climbing, keep climbing, keep climbing. Still not letting me lower the nose. Once it reaches here, the nose is now coming down by itself, if you can see that. So it's just holding the absolutely maximum that it can climb. And that's, so we still have roll control from the aircraft and we're not stalled, which is pretty cool. Absolutely fascinating stuff that Airbus do. So I think that's about all we've got time for, unless we've got some questions as well. There were a couple. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah go. One is, when is this coming to the sim? Well, it should be coming with the uh, sim update 15, if that's correct. That mm -hmm. is correct. Yeah. Yeah. Remember we said it's going to take a few months because it was not stable enough. And then obviously I saw we did stuff on Wasm, et cetera, et cetera. Indie builds did a bunch more work. Mm -hmm. Now we have it. Yay. Yeah. Yeah. And it should be, I mean, it's an absolutely fantastic plane to fly. The most it's, as you can see, I'm not even holding the stick now. It just flies itself. <laughs> That's awesome. Same question. Does it have a uh, radial in function when using DIR now? Uh, that one, not quite yet, but something that we will add. Uh, it's it's more of a little bit more of a complex function because if you just add in the functionality to extend the center line, which is what people were asking for, you're only doing about half the system. So we, we want to do that properly, uh, fully, so you can actually navigate using it, but it will come. Mm -hmm. And your, can you remind, um, there's a question about, is this going to be default it is. Next to the other I mean, so if you, if you dial yeah. back in 2020, we had three airliners, right? 747, 787, and the Neo. And mm -hmm. <clears throat> obviously, Asobo made all those. Then working title improved the two Boeings mm -hmm. um, with what we call aircraft and aviation, avionics updates. And then then I asked Inibuilds, hey, can you improve the Neo? And instead of <laughs> improving it, they just built a new one. So they're actually going to sit right next to each other in the sim coming up mm -hmm. and you can pick which one you like better. I'm actually very curious to see how many people will go switch over yeah. to this one versus stay with the existing one. We'll see. Yeah. And someone asked, will there still be a beta for this plane or will it just release the sim update 15? Well, out of time with the betas. So, but our test team is 
has been testing this with any bills, of course. <clears throat> That's why I said maybe on the 26th a little bit. Like, um, so we might need two more days. Mm -hmm. So there's a chance, you know, we don't know. But like, uh, it looked pretty positive. I just talked to our lead aircraft tester right before this. And he was saying the, the one thing they were looking at was a, was likely a user error. So we might sign off today. Mm -hmm. It's up to our SQ department. Right. Um, well, awesome. Cameron, thank you for showing us the features of the A320neo and for no joining the stream. Yeah, we're looking forward to that, to that coming out in a few weeks' time. We will move on now to our Q&A session two. Uh, this section is going to be on aircraft and general improvements. So I'll start with some of the questions we got from our forum, but chat, be, please feel free to ask some live questions at this time. And here we go. All right, a little over a year ago, it was mentioned in a dev stream that you were working on implementing ray traced effects into the sim. Is this still being worked on? And if so, are you able to share any updates? Um, yeah, I can I can speak to this one. Sure. Uh, so we uh, um, so this is something which has been worked on. Uh, it's a I don't know if um, I mean. The, the the maybe I can go step back a little bit on e explaining how the things how the how the things work. Basically, ray tracing uh, is an algorithm to uh, to improve the quality of reflections. Um, it can be uh, ambient occlusion, lighting, um, basically rendering in the in the scene. Um, currently, uh, 2020 features a, a form of I mean, an optimized form of ray tracing, which is called, which is basically ray marching. We're still going down rays uh, in order to see where the light is coming from, uh, except we're not doing it uh, in some scenery. We're doing it in the in the GPU's uh, render buffers. Mm -hmm. um, this is currently used for uh, real-time ambient occlusion, which is the little shadows and the little below a button or whatever um for reflections um and sometimes it can have grain because you that's that's basically the technique of ray tracing you launch a few rays as many as you can and then you average the the results and because you cannot launch an infinity or billions of rays you just launch so many there can be sometimes uh, only one ray hitting and then on the on the pixel side next to it it doesn't and then you, you start getting some dithering some grains um, so the difference with the real ray tracing that the GPUs do is that you don't ray march in the graphics buffers anymore, like the, the depth buffer. You actually upload uh, geometry into the GPU. You're basically creating a second scenery uh, of the entire uh, environment and airplanes, and uh, and uh, and the GPU has some sort of a, a super optimized rendering engine which does ray tracing directly in there. So it's an extremely uh, uh, I would say a uh, big change, uh, which requires basically to do have a, to have a, uh, uh, almost a secondary rendering engine, which is dedicated to this. I mean, I would say at least the scenery or the data that's created. And because of the scale of this change, that's something which is, uh, being planned for later. Um, uh, and, and not right now in 2020, uh, but we're still working on it. Uh, I mean, the team is very. Hard, hard at work on this feature. It uh, it, it looks great, uh, but that's something which is not currently because of the scale of the changes. Something we can do in 2020. 2020 will keep having ray tracing, but in the simplified world of ray marching. Mm. Awesome. Thanks, Seb. Um, we did get another question about the A320 Neo from any builds so that I'll. Maybe anyone can answer this. Is is uh, since the beta one that was released a while back. Has the FPS improved on the new, the latest versions that you're testing? Um, I can take that one if you want. Um, yeah, it, it should be. We've we've done everything to try and optimize, so it's it's definitely going to be improved upon what what you've seen in the past. A lot of it was rewritten and optimized mm -hmm. across the board, modeling and also WASM memory usage, everything. Awesome. I mean, that was one of the reasons why we didn't ship. Yeah, as you 14 days, it was crashing mm -hmm. too much. Thank you. Next question. In many of the recent sim updates, significant flight model features such as better prop simulation, CFD, and the upcoming ground handling have been implemented in the sim. However, it seems that each of these have only been added to a select few of the default planes so far. 
Will more of these features be added to more of the default planes in the future? I mean, yes, this is already in progress. You can, I mean, just uh, just uh, two minutes ago, uh, uh, on the A320 Neo, um, they are using the new ground handling. Uh, I think uh, when Walking Title updated the Cirrus, they used the CFD and the new propellers. Um, it's it's it takes a lot of work, right? To um, to uh, update the plane with these new features sometimes. Uh, what we're trying to do is to um, not just, uh, I mean, when we go into a plane again, uh, we try to not just uh, do a little bit of tweaks, but we try to go back to the, I mean, how we did it the first time, right? We we flew the plane, we took a little bit of data, uh, we worked with the test pilots and we, we tried to get it as good as we could with the data we had. We have a, a, a new process now, we have better data collection, so we go fly the planes again, we get much better data, and then we use the new systems to improve the aircraft. And so that it takes just some time to do it, but uh, you've already gotten a few, and uh, and uh, I think every time a plane will get uh, updated, it takes advantage as much as possible of these new features. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Seb. Um, some questions in chat here about, uh, it says a while ago that Sobo would be working with NVIDIA to apply a mask around glass displays when DLSS is enabled to prevent some blurriness. Um, is there any update in this and could FSR2 benefit from this as well? Uh, yes, I was a little bit surprised to read that uh, because I know that the, the task has been done and tested and, and pushed. So it looks like it's not working for everybody or I think something has been broken. So uh, we'll take care of that. I'm, I'm going, uh, to be honest, I've been the, the coders while we were speaking, just to uh, to ask them to have a look on that. Mm -hmm. Awesome. For me, it was done. So okay. I'm missing something here. OK. Thanks, Marcial. Um, Scotty says, hello, Jorg. Your stuffed animals, along with that amazing plant, are looking wonderful. Thank oh, you. Go. <laughs> All right, next question we have is have you made changes regarding the system depth of the AnyBuilds A320 to improve performance? If yes, what did you remove? I can't think Cameron should speak to this. Yeah, we the aircraft you're going to get now is simply a higher fidelity version of what you've seen before. Nothing, nothing was removed. Things were just rewritten to be more performant across the board. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's quite a few new features, like the one I showed off there with the angle of attack. Everything has been added in rather than taken away. Okay. Thank you, Cameron. We can, take, the, the, we can take that. So I saw that in the feedback snapshot, the PW1000 engine. We talked about it. Mm -hmm. How about this? I, I uh, We could do it, but we don't want to delay anymore. So maybe in the future, Cameron and I will discuss. Cameron yeah. Michael and I will discuss. All right. Has any more thought been given to releasing the camera API? There's a lot of community. A lot of the community would like Chase Plane, but cannot get it because you can't release the API to them. Hi, Edson. <laughs> I honestly think this is something we, we will discuss again internally. Like we, I don't know. I think we sometimes go in and out on this particular topic. Mm -hmm. But I saw like 30 messages here. Like, it's not like what I'm reading everything, right? And I'm reading it after the show, too. And like, so um, we'll, we'll discuss. Great. Thanks, York. All right. And Dynamic. Well, just just oh, a word sure. about because I've seen a comment about uh, when I said uh, I, I think it was done. It may be, mm -hmm. it might have been done and not pushed because of some side effect. So there's something I'm missing here. Uh, I don't have the information. Yeah. It's a large project. It's very hard to be aware of any single aspect of this depth. Mm -hmm. so I know what it's worth uh, for everyone, right? We talked to Edson in Houston at the last expo. So it's been it's almost a, you know eight months ago, whatever that was. And we look, we explored all kinds of things. But I mean, um, we should just pick this up again, Marcel. Let's take mm -hmm. this as a takeaway out of this. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right. Next question that we have. Dynamic LOD is a big thing for many of us uh, yeah. with more load on the ground and having better visuals when airborne, reducing LOD settings when flying lower or on approach greatly helps to get a fluid experience. Are there any plans on introducing dynamic graphic LOD settings as a stock feature on PC? Um, so we we so this is I mean, I talked I talked about this just to mm -hmm. 
a few minutes ago. This is exactly how it works already on, on the Xbox. Uh, this system is, is working very, very well. Uh, and uh, actually, we, we never thought about doing this on PC, and I think it's actually a very, very good idea. Uh, so I think we put this somewhere on a backlog. It's I don't think it's it's very complex because it's already working very well. It's just opening the option and adding adding a button, translating, and all all, all this. But uh, I think we put it under our backlog and and added. It. It's a very good idea. We never I think we never had this on our plans, but uh, it's an easy addition, and I I agree with the community. It works very well. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Seb. Um, can we expect multiplayer bush flights to be fixed anytime soon? Um, I know in Sim Update 15 there are three bush trips that were fixed. Uh, I'm not sure if that's the ones you are referring to, but let us know in chat. Okay, we have some more announcements from Jorg. So Jorg, I'm going to hand it what off to you. Oh, oh, is this city update stuff? This ah, is. Yeah. Announcement time. All right. So this is, if you go to the next slide, city update six is Southwest Germany. And up until last week, it was called Baden-Württemberg, which is where I'm from. Wow. <laughs> and everyone's like, what's Baden-Württemberg? Like, oh, screw it. It's like Southwest Germany. Okay. That's what we're doing. And so here I'm taking you on a little trip. So it starts at the very Northwest of that particular state in Mannheim. This is all by the way on the Rhine river. So Mannheim, this is a famous water tower. If you go to the next slide, this is Heidelberg, famous specifically for Americans for some reason, but it's a beautiful castle. I've been there. It's lovely. So this is the, what is called sort of the, the eastern part of the, the, the state. Keep going. We're going to go further. For, oh, we're going to Karlsruhe further south. So this is the Rhine River, river. You see a little harbor thing, and you see the city in the background. This is the university where my brother studied and a famous castle in that town in the right. Then we go to Stuttgart. So this is the um, palace in Stuttgart and downtown. And then the next shot is what actually probably the most famous thing of that state. This is Mercedes-Benz. And of those of you who are soccer fans, this is where VfB Stuttgart is playing. And they're currently third in the German Bundesliga. So I'm, I'm very happy about that. And then if you keep going, we're going to Esslingen, which is a lovely town with vineyards. Almost looks like Bordeaux in some ways. Next. We're going to Kehl, which nobody ever heard of, but it has a famous bridge called the Europa Bridge, which goes over to, and I'm cheating here, Strasbourg. It's not at all in southwest Germany, but it's in the same what we call AOI. So I'm like, hey, let's, let's have a new Strasbourg. So that's where the European Parliament is. And here you can see the next picture shows you the, the Minster. And then you see the Vorge in the back, Vogesen in German, and the Il. And then we go further south to Friedrichshafen. And this is an airport made by Inibils um keep going so this is lake constance back there and then you see it's kind of a famous airport aero is there and for what it's worth somebody asked that at the very beginning of all this um are we going to aero i don't know <laughs> so i'm tentatively thinking about going to europe um but whether or not we're going to show up at aero i'm discussing it with aero and frankly with winfried from aerosoft so we'll see so 50 50 still and then here this is one of the famous planes that is parked at that airport. For what it's worth, you don't know where Friedrichshafen is, Lake Constance, Ferdinand Kraft Zeppelin built Zeppelins there, and then Donier is located there with their famous water planes. And that leads us to Local Legend 15 by Inibuilt, and it is the, yoo-hoo, super excited, Donier Do 31. It's one of my childhood dreams aircraft. So if you turn the next, mm -hmm. there's only three ever made. Two of them are in museums. One is in Friedrichshafen. The third one, nobody seems to know where it is. And Inibuilds build it. And we have Michael here to walk us through it. Hi, Michael. Hi. Welcome Hello, everyone. To the How are you? Thank uh, you. Glad to have you. Um, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about this plane and your work on it? Yeah. No pressure from York now. And it's his favorite <laughs> charter plane now. Thanks. Um, so, yeah, the, the Dornier 31, uh, jet powered vertical takeoff and landing uh, experimental military aircraft, as you alluded to, only three ever made, two of which were airworthy. And only one of those was actually VTOL cable uh, in the end. The other had its lift engines completely removed. So it's only conventional, conventional flight. Um, but yeah, it holds the distinction of being uh, aviation history's only jet-powered VTOL utility and transport aircraft uh, ever created. First flying in February 1967, 
performed a number of experimental and public demonstration flights uh, before the program was, was cancelled for various reasons. Um, but yeah, really, really unique looking aircraft. Basically uses brute force and ignorance to get into the air. Um, very little <laughs> kind of aerodynamic stability on this thing, which was a challenge in itself for the development team who, who absolutely hate me now with the amount of uh, questions. And uh, can we just... Uh, can we just do this on it? But um, yeah, so the massive Rolls Royce Pegasus engines underneath the wings, wow. and then hidden away uh, in the in the wingtips here, these four uh, Rolls Royce again, um, kind of vertical lift engines. So a total of of ten going on uh, behind the scenes there. Uh, if we have a look inside, then so as I said, it was it was designed as a transport aircraft, um, so plenty of space in the in the cargo area for passengers and, and what have you. Um, it did actually have quite a limited uh, payload capacity in the end, which is one of the reasons it was cancelled. But um, it, it was going in the right direction, certainly for the experiments it was carrying out. Uh, if we come forward now into the kind of uh, forward flight deck area, you see a huge amount of racks of avionics equipment and, um, and different computers here. Uh, I'll talk about this in a, in a little bit more detail in a second, but um, they basically created their own supercomputer to help with the stability issues that they were having to start with. Moving forward into the actual uh, flight deck, uh, two-person flight deck here, and you definitely needed two people to fire this thing. Just look at the number of thrust levers and stuff you got going on there. It was purely the co-pilot's responsibility to adjust all those levers, uh, especially in vertical flight lift. Something which, again, was a bit of a challenge for us to try and you know get into uh, into the simulator, but hopefully we've uh, we've got it nailed and, and made it accessible to everyone. So I'm going to cheat a little bit here and uh, get the engines uh, started going up in sequence so you can see the sequence start to go there and the lift engines um so talking a bit more about the engines uh like i said the rolls royce pegasus turbofan engines with the vector thrust uh the same ones you get the cc on the harrier these were the very early versions of that though so the pre-production variants it wasn't even in the harrier at this point i don't think um plus the four um well eight in total four on each wing rolls royce turbojet uh vertical lift engines given an aggregate Thrust are around 66,000 uh, pounds. So, like I said, brute force to get this thing into the air, pretty much. Um, only a handful of aircraft had a total of 10 or more engines um, kind of used. Uh, another one was the Dornier X again. Um, so, Dornier kind of, you know, known for these excessive amount of engines on aircraft. Um, as I said, it's got its own kind of supercomputer going on here. The, the, the the two-person flight deck plus the supercomputer is what made this thing fly, really. Um, so in, in all its flight regimes, uh, the hybrid kind of analog and digital computer known as the DO960 um, was what enabled it to be uh, have its pre precise control in, in hover flight. Uh, also, auto trim uh, system was redesigned for this to, to transition into conventional modes as well. And like I said, it definitely needed both pilots to operate this thing. You, you, you can't fly this single pilot. Uh, and it's something we've we've had to manage in terms of systems integration. Um, so I, I urge people to read the manual for sure when you when you try and fly this thing. It, it's not the Harrier. You can't just get in, vector the thrust, and off you go. Um, you, you've got to kind of know what you you're trying to achieve with this thing. Mm -hmm. um, so if we go kind of outside, I'm going to try not to show myself up and uh, <laughs> demonstrate the the vertical lift on this thing. Um, so all the engines are kind of running now uh, through that auto start sequence. The lift engines are, are spooled up. And, um, oh, I did forget one thing. Stability system to turn it on. Let's flick that. Well, there's three levels of stability, but that you definitely need that one, like I say, to, to help fly it. And what it's basically simulating is, is the co-pilot for us, um, controlling the thrust and nozzle levers, and then transitioning to the forward flight. So. Here we go, trying to attempt to get it into the air as the uh, as the frost falls up. So the nozzles go down to their 490 degrees. A bit of a wobble on the sap as it gets there <laughs> on, but up we go. And then the transition to forward flight, um, basically commanded by by the um, by the uh, the co-pilot there, and uh, the nozzles start to come back as well. Once we get a bit of forward speed going, gear can come up. Never see anything like that. And um, there we go. Off we go. <laughs> and once it's up and airborne, it's it's uh, it's actually very stable and um, and quite quite nippy as well, going up to kind of 250, 300 knots um, 
in full forward flight. So as you kind of fully develop into the conventional flight, lift engines can go away. And there we go, airborne over Friedrichstrahl. One question we could uh, just get from chat. Will there be a PDF manual available for this local legend on day one? Uh, 100%, yeah. So it's included as part of the package. And for mm -hmm. Xbox users, we'll, we'll obviously put it online as well. Awesome. Sounds like everyone's going to need Thanks, to read Michael. that. That's, <laughs> yeah. that's a dream, man. Yeah. There we go. It's fantastic. So cool. Very, very cool plane. Thank you, Michael, for joining us. <laughs> <laughs> for showing us his plane um very appreciative and we can't wait to see this um local legend 15 did i get that right oh. yeah. all right we are now going to move on to our q a session three uh, a few questions here about world hub and vr all right so first question about the world hub is it planned to be able to add default library objects to airports in the World Hub? And if not, why? So here's how I think about this, right? So this is an alpha. And so far, it's been great. You know, I think 1,200 something people signed up. I think we get about 80 to 100 submissions a week. And this is all going well. And we're just trying to ease ourselves into this. Um, so. I, I think we will plan, we will work this. We will expand this over years to come um but right now we're just trying to get this out to a broader audience and then we'll we'll see if everything works well and then we'll add features as before you know it's easy to get ahead of yourself mm -hmm. okay thank you york and is it planned as one of the features to be able to add newly built taxiways and runways which are not yet visible on the underlying bing map to airports in the world hub in order to stay current to the charts Marcel, do you want to say anything to this? Are you muted? Marcel? <laughs> oh, looks like it. <laughs> I will give you a few shares. Okay, yeah. Um, sorry for that. Sure. So, um, um, so it has been a decision we made uh, to rely on the uh, um, IR first uh, because um, the other decisions to to uh, to allow people to use the, a logical export without having the, the good aerials was not considered as a, a viable one. Mm -hmm. So we know that we, um, so we have some conventions. That's why we have asked people to, to rely on the aerial first. And we do have some rules, but I do think that those rules have not been exposed properly. So Nicola Popuniak was working on the, the world up and we have been working a lot with the, the team on this is going to collect the the rules and uh, the convention that we've decided to allow people to to work with uh, within these rules and to have a an easier submission process mm -hmm. cool. and then maybe on top of that just just make sure that everybody understands so we are you know we get areas from bing as you know and we update them with world updates there's a bunch that goes into it right so we can't just take a bunch of images and don't do anything because we have to go on color correction and tree detection and all kinds of other processes. So can't do it all the time, which is why we're sort of doing it per, per, per basically um, with world updates. But because we're launching flights in 2024 later this year, we're going to update the entire world. We just actually talked to the Bing guys. It's about, I think, 250 terabytes or something that we need to go uh, update because of there has been updates since, since we launched. And then we'll have latest latest we can possibly get from bing uh data so i think that will get take us a long way to get current because in some ways in some areas we are three years behind that's it's just one of the one of the situations we're in but it'll be it'll be much better end of this year and yeah and that those areas are shared but basically the world a lot of the world between 2024 and 2020 will be the same like mm -hmm. 2024 will have lots of extra features and blah 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 and we'll see more about this but but the, the raw data, so that the DEM, for example, or the aerials are in fact shared. Cool. Okay. How long does it take to update, would you say 250 terabytes of yeah, data? No idea. Seems like a <laughs> lot. <laughs> but the Bing guys didn't seem very stressed. So I'm like, okay, okay. cool. Well, that's great. <laughs> cool. Um, all right. Thank you for answering that question. 
Um, we have a, v, a VR question now. When the logbook pop-up was changed a long time ago, it created a bug in VR during shutdown of the aircraft at the end of a flight. When you are shutting down the plane of all the open, all of the open panels close and the camera resets to the default zoom view in the cockpit. It can be very jarring in VR and completely kills the immersion during aircraft shutdown. This has been shown as bug logged in the forums for a long time, but has never been fixed. This is probably the main VR issue that people would like to see fixed when they complain that VR is never touched or improved. Is there an issue with, with fixing this and why has it not already been fixed after all this time? So as a matter of fact, I spent some time to uh, try to experience exactly this um, and, and with the team. And how can I say that? Um, so doing some development, whatever it is, VR or not, it's always a matter of balancing and how many times it will cost to fix the, the issue and what you could do with uh, this same amount of time on the simulation. And so to, to be honest, this jarring thing has been considered not as, well, Im important, not that bothering. Uh, I do think that you could experience some differences depending on the frame rate you're getting on the PC. And to be honest, the first time I tried to reproduce the bug, I even didn't see it. Um, so I don't know what to say, except that we are balancing the amount of time that we are spending on the simulation. And this one has not be prioritized uh, because of what, what I've just said. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm know that I'm going to be seen as a bad guy here, but it's a, it's the reality of a product of creating a game. I'm very sorry. Fair. Thank you, Marcel, for the answer. All right, we are looking at our roadmap now, York, after oh, again. that discussion. So let's yeah, take a well, real quick couple of new things, you know, still early in the year. What do we have now in March? Yep. So it's going to be lots of stuff. But so Southwest Germany and the Donier were at it. Yep. Very exciting. Very and fun. Jorg, hmm. you know what the next slide is, if you're ready. I don't remember. <laughs> it is ah! this. Yeah. <laughs> Well, so basically, as you can imagine, somebody said, hey, can we get anything? So we, we will have at moments that are uh, a little bit more, uh, I guess, glorious or something. We'll have larger rollouts, right? You know, there's an Xbox show and things like that. that at some point, we'll show a new trailer and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Then we'll, but anyway, so I wanted to at least do something. And um, so my idea was, hey, why don't we talk about the airplanes that we've already shown? and give a little bit of context. So here, this is the Jetson Aero Jetson 1, which we had in the trailer in last year. And then the next one, I saw some questions from people like, uh, this is obviously a vision jet uh, from Cirrus. And I wanted to give a little bit of context. So there's a story here before we move on. Mm -hmm. I got a phone call from the, from the CEO of Cirrus, his name is Sean, and he said, hey, you know, so there are two things. He, a, he's like, there's a, there's a new version of the SR-22 coming out. Can we get that in the flight sim? We're like, sure. So basically, there was work being done to make that happen. And then he said, I really, really, really want to get the Vision Jet into the base sim. I'm like, okay, okay. So Vision Jet, one of the most popular GA planes out there. Um, how do you say no to that? So I'm like, okay. But we don't want to compete. So if you go to the next slide there, then I looked around. So we... So do we build a vision jet? And then it turns out that there is a vision jet and it's actually really, really great. And I think lots of you know about this. If you use the next picture, these are not our screenshots. They're the screenshots from the developer. And if you go to the next slide, yay, we are working with FlightFX. So they're building both the, the, the Jetson and also a upgraded version, new version of the uh, vision jet that will be part of the base sim in flights in 2024. And why do I want to say all this? Because it exists, because it's already out there. So I just want to give people the heads up. Hey, we're doing this. Um, it's going to be in the base queue. We have we had discussed, should we pull it from the marketplace? And we said, no, that's kind of lame. People need to make their own decisions, but I want to make sure that you know. And maybe, maybe, maybe to prevent accidents. Actually, if you, if you want to give feedback to via our 
tools uh, I would like to hear should we pull it off the marketplace because I'm a little bit worried that people buy this in September or something and then you know right after that comes flights in 2024 and it's in there so I was thinking about maybe pulling it from the marketplace at least our marketplace in June or so but I'm flexible um, so give some feedback Jane will tell me but anyways good news is flight effects made a badass airplane and and Cirrus loved it so much that they and they love the simulator, by the way, that they want it in the base queue. So we're going to do this. And just for the future, I want to make sure that... So I will probably have a little section in each one of these uh, dev Q&As where we talk a little bit about, hey, these aircraft, these are the people who are actually making these aircraft. And one of the things that I probably want to say, and maybe you already know about this, like the the level of quality in 2024 for aircraft is is definitely, definitely payware quality, right? When we did 2020, that wasn't really the case, as you know, but this is not, like going forward, we're gonna have a whole bunch of really great aircraft from great developers like Flight, like Flight Effect. Mm -hmm. Awesome, great announcement. And the last one. Oh yeah, and I wanna say we will see at least some of you in Las Vegas. Uh, so we signed up. Um, this Seb and I last year in Houston, we had a great time. I lo I loved, loved, loved it. And I think Seb felt the same. It was just great. The, the whole community, Evan was exactly right when he said, this is a super harmonious, you know? And I'm like, really? And I was like, yep, he was totally true. It was, uh, it was like a warm blanket of aviation love. And uh, we're coming back. We, we, we booked our, we booked our floor already. And there will be some stuff that we talk about with 2024, of course. There might be some other things we're doing. Should be exciting. I'm excited. Looking forward to it. Absolutely. All right. Thank you, Jorg, Seb, and Marcel for joining, as well as Cameron and Michael from Any Built for joining on today's stream. Uh, chat, thank you for asking so many questions. I know we didn't get to all of them, but we hopefully answered um, all the, as many as we could for you today. Of course, we do this about monthly, so we'll be back likely in April for our next development stream. Uh, but until then, of course, please enjoy the release of Sim Update 15 later mm -hmm. in March. Um, and appreciate all the love and support that you have given to the Sim and, of course, to these streams. Um, Jorg, anything you'd like to add? I would just say thank you, Cameron. Thank you, Michael. Thanks for getting the A320 done and making it great. And uh, that, that door 31, <laughs> it literally is a childhood dream. So it's like, it's so amazing that we can have that in flight sim. And for all of you guys, thank you so much for coming to this. And this is, this is going to be a great year for flight simulation. There's no doubt about it. So mm -hmm. thanks for everything. Thanks, Jorg. And Seb? Yeah, thank you. And, and see you in a month. <laughs> <laughs> Marcia? Thank you very much for uh, all the, the love and passion you, you put in your sim. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> all right. And of course, looking forward to seeing some of you in person at Flight Sim Expo. It's great, great for the community to get to know each other and to meet up with other simmers. Definitely recommend if anyone's on the fence about going. Um, it is really a great experience. So we hope to see you there. All right. We'll talk to you in about a month or so. Uh, I'll see you in the forums or on Discord or anywhere else. And we'll see you soon. Thanks, everyone. Bye. See you.